matrix. Uh, we run the company together. He does up most of the catching. 99.9999 percent of the catching. Um, and I do a lot of fish clubbing and um, uh, retailing and things like that. So I feel like when he's not around. Um, Mark's been fishing since 1978. Um, he's, a, he's a snapper grouper fisherman, which means that he does vertical hook and line only. Um, he, it's sort of hard to believe if you think about someone making a living. People think about fishing, they think of nets or long lines or things like that. He is literally one person with sometimes one or two other people on a boat. Um, one line and maybe two hooks at a time, just dropping for days at a time. Uh, the trip's going anywhere from three days to ten days. Um, it's a pretty clean fishery as far as because you're not using nets, you're not using gear that's left un untended. Um, and so for that, you know, that's a good thing. One of the challenges we face in the kind of fishery that Mark fishes in is um, basically he's going out to the reefs. And when you drop a hook on a reef, you don't choose what you're going to catch. You can't see what's down there. And there's about, just in the snapper grouper complex alone, there's 72 different species. Um, what's interesting about a lot of our species is their biology. And that's what makes when the fishing gets challenging. So everyone here loves grouper, or at least, you know, knows restaurants can sell grouper, right? It's a huge, you know, thing. The problem with grouper is they live really, really long. Grouper can live to be up to 75 years old. They grow really, really slow, and they have, a lot of them have this very little funky thing that they do, that they change sex in the middle of their life. <laughs> so don't we all sometimes wish we could do that? If there are enough, basically what happens is, <laughs> They don't replace themselves very fast. Um, they are very aggressive when they become males, and so they get caught easier. They aggregate to spawn, so they get caught easier. So for all those things, the problem becomes, everyone comes to Charleston, everyone wants Grouper, everyone loves Grouper, and Grouper is like the last thing, not necessarily the last thing, but you have to be much more careful with Grouper than you have to be with many other species. So one of the things we've tried to do with our company and our chefs, which Charles was one of our first buyers. Uh, Mike Lada, Sean Brock, Jeremiah Bacon, Craig Dillo. All of those folks were on board very early with what we're trying to do, which is introduce the customer to a wide variety of species and, and change what people think of when they go to order fish. Uh, an example may be, I don't know if you're all familiar with seeing amberjack on the menu recently, or even back a little farther, trigger fish. If someone had told me 10 years ago the trigger fish would be on a fine dining menu. Someone had told any fisherman 10 years ago that someone would pay $25 a plate to eat trigger fish, we would have never, ever believed you. But part of what's happened with Mark uh, working with the chefs in town who are open minded and ready to move that way is we've been able to take the pressure off the fish like Rupert and introduce the customer base to, hope to all different fish. Uh, trigger fish is an example, um, amberjack is another example. Banded rudderfish is a very popular fish at the moment that um, Mark and another chef have worked to develop a market for golden cowfish. So basically, you know, sort of the point of what we do and what would be the take home point of uh, my speech, I guess, would be to, we've been thinking outside the box. We've been thinking about sustainability. We've been working with chefs in order to help sustainability, but also make sure there's always fish there for the chefs to have. And you cannot have a menu. You can't be a restaurant that can really promote sustainable seafood and talk about who you are if you have grouper on the menu all year long. You can't even do it if you have snapper on the menu all year long. Those fish close in the South Atlantic for seasons for a reason. And um, basically, you know, if you want to bring it in for somewhere else and that's what your restaurant needs, that's fine. But what we're trying to do is work with the chefs to say, get your customer base used to knowing they're going to sit down at a restaurant and they're not always going to see the same kind of fish on the menu. Because that's not the way nature works. That's not what's best for the fish. Um, you know, you're not always going to mahi mahi. And mahi mahi run around here from March until June if you're lucky. And the rest of the year, it's not from here. It's got a huge carbon footprint. It's getting brought in from countries that aren't fishing it sustainably. Think about those things. 
customers are willing to try different kinds of fish. Um, it's also lovely when you can tell your customers, I know the fisherman that brought me this fish. I talked to him this morning, or, or he called his wife on the satellite phone, and she called me, and I know what I'm going to have tomorrow on the menu. Um, it's a whole different way of looking at sourcing that product, and I would just encourage everyone to sort of think about it that way. <laughs> what kind of fish is that? What kind of banded? A banded butterfish. Rudder. So that's a fish that um, it's sort of in the Amtrak family. Uh, Amtrak team and all cousins, top water, not on, not on the bottom of the lake, but higher up in the water column. Um, again, this is one of those fish that was not being brought in at all commercially a year and a half to two years ago. They were, they, if they were brought in, they were getting shipped to Canada, which was happening. We started our business because all of our fish was getting coming off the dock, going on a truck, going to Canada or Baltimore. The Baltimore stuff would get bought by people in Atlanta, get brought back to Atlanta, get bought by a local seafood company, and brought back to Charleston. And so there was no trouble for us. And so being a bird fish is one of those fish, if anyone brought them in because they caught them, they'd get 25 cents a pound and it would go on a truck to Canada with other stuff. And um, Mark and another chef, you know, he was Yeah. <laughs> 
it's taking over the reef system, unfortunately, very, very fast and very, very aggressively in the entire southeast. Um, I was just snorkeling in the Keys in the spring and barely offshore at all, and they were, they were there, it's, which is really too bad because now we're fighting. But basically, they are poisonous, you know, to some extent if you get pricked, but the flesh is edible. It's very, you know, it tastes, it tastes great as a fish. Um, in order to catch them right now, the only way people are able to catch them is to dive for them, which off of our coast means diving um, what we call mixed gas, and it's sort of dangerous, and only crazy people do it, and uh, there's not a lot of people out there doing it, or they trap, and there is no legal trap fishery in the South Atlanta. So we're all sort of trying to figure out how to, because we know the chefs want it, um, and it would help to have a fishery for it, because then we can Unfortunately, all the ways to catch them are probably not good for the other. 